I can start, I can start with a presentation of the seminar series. Uh, thanks everyone for joining today. Uh, we have a new edition of this seminar series uh, from the Cambridge Series Unit. Uh, first, I would like to thank the sponsors of the unit. We are really thankful uh, for their support uh, and uh, funding. And uh, today we have uh, with us uh, Alexander uh, Tong. Uh, he's a postdoc uh, working with uh, Joshua Benjo uh, at uh, Mila in Montreal. He works uh, at uh, uh, studying the, the causal discovery of cell dynamics uh, and on many different areas, as we are going to see. Uh, he also collaborated at the beginning of his uh, postdoc more now with uh, people from uh, Germany, the Helmholtz International Lab. Uh, he completed his PhD in computer science uh, in the computer science department at Yale University in 2021 and his research interests are in generative modeling, deep learning and optimal transport. He's working on applying ideas from generative modeling, causal discovery, optimal transport and graph signal processing to understand how cells develop and respond to changing conditions and he's interested in generative models for protein design and he co-founded a startup Greenfold to work on these problems and he's going to start uh, very soon a faculty position at uh, Duke University. Uh, and uh, yeah, today he's going to talk about uh, this area of uh, uh, protein modeling with uh, deep generative models. Uh, I think that's all from my side. I will stop sharing the slide. And uh, Alex, uh, I think you can share your slides. Thanks. So, um... Uh, is that, yep, yeah. seems like it's working. Cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah, thanks for having me. Um, cool. Yes, yeah, so I'm going to be talking about uh, sort of the, uh, the, the flow models we've been working on and how they apply to protein uh, design and curious, uh, you know, I see some others that are working on a similar area. So always curious about their thoughts. Uh, let's see. Um, cool. So yeah, uh, today I'm going to be talking about sort of flow matching algorithms first, uh, and then sort of how you can make them slightly faster with optimal transport, and then how you apply it to protein design. Um, and in particular, sort of these, uh, the, the folding models and then the generative models, uh, which were our sort of family of models called fold flow. And we're trying to figure out how to uh, do generative design with the flow matching algorithms and trying to go sort of both, uh, both uh, all, all sorts of generative problems with the, the protein. So, yeah. Um, cool. So, yeah, so I'll start here, I guess, right? So flow matching is, uh, is light diffusion, uh, very, very similar. Some may say basically the same, um, but, uh, it's sort of a nice way of looking at things and it scales to high dimensions. So in stable diffusion three, they use flow matching instead of, uh, diffusion. And this is, uh, this gives you sort of faster inference and, and, uh, maybe potentially faster training too. So yeah, this sort of stuff scales, although I won't be talking about uh, that size of model. Uh, so uh, what is this and, and why is it useful? Um, okay, so just a little background, right? Diffusion models, we take uh, a clean sample, uh, diffuse it over time to some sort of noise, some sort of noise, so destroying the information, and then try and recover that information with a reverse SD. So uh, try and... Uh, Great. Uh, yeah, so uh, you're trying to recover the information, uh, learning this score function uh, in particular, and that allows you to uh, generate from noise back to data. Uh, so this is the general principle is you can learn one step at a time uh, in, in many sort of short increments. Uh, in contrast, we have uh, continuous non-lining flows, which is very similar, but it uses an ODE instead of an SD. So instead of stochastic dynamics, it uses a deterministic uh, dynamics to flow from a noise point to a uh, sort of matching noise points to data points. Um, and so you're still learning a flow function. Uh, it's just a different flow function. It's not a, a score, but it's still uh, it's still sort of a vector field over the space. Um, okay, so just very simple. How do you do score matching? Um, Right, you sample your data point, uh, could be an image, could be a protein, could be anything, sample the time, add noise to that, and try and regress sort of the, the conditional score, so oftentimes a Gaussian, 
And so easily just uh, basically trying to recover your clean data point from your noisy, noisy data point. Um, and that's all you need to train. So that's very simple. If you're trying to do inference, right? <laughs> what you do is sample a random noise point and try to integrate over time uh, using your learn score function. And that allows you to recover your data point. And so uh, the, I guess the point of flow matching is you can, uh, if you try and make this lower variance in your training objective and try and integrate in fewer steps, these are sort of the points that are, that are um, sort of important to get higher efficiency with these type of models. So uh, in particular, this, this type of thing is high variance because, well, depending on what data point you sample, it can change a lot um, and what noise point you sample. So, yeah. Um, and then the number of steps, people have done a lot of work uh, trying to reduce the number of steps in diffusion models. Uh, and there's many different methods. Uh, one of them is sort of uh, is, is uh, converting it into an ODE. So um, the, one of the easy steps is sort of uh, using this equivalence between a stochastic differential equation and the probability flow ODE to say I can uh, have a deterministic flow that has the sort of the same mapping of marginals. So uh, at each point in time, you have the same probability distribution as the stochastic differential equation. So that means if you integrate with the probability flow ODE, you'll get uh, sort of the same distribution of samples as you would with the stochastic differential equation, uh, at least in theory. And then um, so if you use this instead, you can integrate with an ODE, and ODEs are much faster to integrate than SDs. And why is this? It's because, uh, well, you can use sort of these advanced solvers, and they may be smoother. And there's, there's sort of reasons um, yeah, why they may be faster. So uh, using sort of these ODEs are much easier to integrate, um, but how do we how do we sort of learn these, these normalizing flows? So that's what flow matching is sort of useful for, is trying to instead, uh, sorry. So yeah, it's trying to instead, um, Figure out how to how to learn these sort of uh, deterministic dynamics. So, um, so yeah. But so right, the easy thing to do is first thing is to uh, do deterministic inference is to do the same regression, do the same training, but then just integrate with an ODE. And so this uh, this leads to a lot of speed up. Um, but one of the problems here is that these are still very sort of curvy paths, right? So the number of steps you need to do to integrate an ODE. Uh, with some accuracy is dependent on how cur uh, how much curvature your path has. So if your path has a lot of curvature, then it takes a lot of steps. Uh, but if it's a completely straight line, then in theory, so like this middle point, then you could do in one step. Um, and so this uh, and so uh, this is sort of the goal is basically to make these paths as straight as possible. Um, because if you can make the path straight, then you could integrate in one step. Um, so flow matching is sort of a generalization of score matching, and it gives you more efficient algorithms uh, depending on which flow you choose. Uh, so in particular, uh, Lipin introduced sort of this OT flow, which takes your data point and does an optimal transport between uh, your data point and uh, normal zero one Gaussian, and that allows you to sort of get uh, straight uh, conditional paths. This is very interesting uh, because, well, now we're sort of uh, able to choose which paths we take and then um, are able to choose ones that are more efficient. Uh, cool. Okay, so why does this work? Okay, so um, in general for diffusion, the idea, right, is that, okay, so we're going to introduce some notation, right? So um, in diffusion, Z is a data point, uh, QZ is a data distribution, uh, PT is noisy data uh, at time T. And then PT of X given Z, so given a data point, is a is a noisy data point. So you can think of this as sort of a noised image. Um, and so why this works is because basically this identity holds. So when you look at the the the, the marginal distribution, it's equivalent to the uh, integration over the conditional. So right, integrate over your data set. Um, the thing that you actually want to learn, which is the marginal, which is the marginal score, is equivalent to sort of the average of a bunch of uh, conditional scores. Um, and so this is this is really what you care about is that when you take the gradient with respect to theta, so your parameters when you're doing this learning objective, uh, then you're you're able to uh, regress against the conditional score equivalently to the marginal score. And so this allows you to uh, use something that's very easy to calculate. So this conditional score, which is just the score of a Gaussian, uh, instead of something which is the score of a data set, which is very difficult to calculate. Um, you need all the sort of the full data distribution. Um, so yeah, that's that's the basic idea right behind it, score matching. But uh, it turns out for flows, you can do exactly the same thing. So uh, regressing against so in a similar way, regressing against flow is, a, is the same as regressing against a marginal flow. So uh, 
using sort of the same math, we're able to say, well, for actually this applies not just the score, but any any function at all. So you're allowed to say uh, for any UT, which is any sort of vector field flow, uh, this this uh, as long as this sort of marginalization holds, then uh, you can do the same thing. So your sort of marginal flow is equivalent to and we're going to get your conditional flow. Um, and so maybe a little bit idea just uh, of the proof behind this, right? It's very easy. You sort of you just expand out the square. So you get this expansion on the left hand side, this expansion on the right hand side. Um, and you can see, well, many things match up, right? So these things are the same because uh, we defined, we assume this was true about uh, your conditional scores. So you have to be able to integrate your conditional scores to get your marginal, uh, sorry, uh, flows. Um, and then you're able to, well, say these are the same. Uh, these are independent of theta. So of course, this is the this is the term that gets uh, you get rid of when you take the gradient of theta. Um, and this this uh, this side is equivalent to the left hand side here, and this is the right hand side. So these two things are equivalent. Um, and so yeah, this is sort of the the basic idea. So for this uh, for this squared error, then you're able to do this this transformation for any flow. Um, yeah. Okay, so what does this help you solve? So what's nice about flows is that you can go from sort of any distribution to start with uh, to any distribution at the end uh, and learn this flow that changes over space and time and allows you to integrate points from your starting distribution to your ending distribution. So in this case, in 2D from eight Gaussians to two moons. Um, and that's really quite useful. So uh, of course, you know, we can use it in 2D, but also in, in, in on images or on proteins. So on proteins in particular, it's gonna be sort of noisy proteins to uh, clean protein structures for us. Uh, cool, and so, uh, yeah, I guess, you know, so just right highlighting the benefits here. So th the idea is that if you can uh, try to get a cleaner loss with less variance, then you can have faster training. Uh, if you're going to do, uh, particular types of flows and you get faster inference. And then I think mean, flows are also easier to implement in some of the um, in some of the manifold spaces because you only have to parameterize based on points instead of trying to figure out how heat diffuses over the manifold. Um, I'll get back to that a little bit later. Sorry, one one question. Yes. You mentioned here Please. the reduced uh, variance in the objective mm -hmm. uh, via optimal transport. Can you give yes. some insights on why you would have here less variance uh, in the objective or? Yes, for sure. So intuition, um, the idea is uh, if you have optimal transport, then if you look at a point in space and time, uh, there's sort of only uh, there's only one pair of points that 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 will hit that. So sort of uh, looking at the distribution for any point in space and time, like you're, you're trying to figure out, uh, maybe this will be more clear in a second, um, sort of, uh, yeah, yeah, let me let me just uh, continue a little bit and I'll give it a little bit better intuition there. Um, okay, no yeah, let's see. Okay, so yeah. Um, okay, so here's how I think about it. So okay, so this is an easy example with two Gaussians and one Gaussian. Uh, so here you're in flow matching, you're gonna take samples from both um, and you're going to draw sort of paths in between the two. And so this is sort of an infinite mixture of Gaussians. And so uh, why, uh, yeah. Uh, and so this is sort of the, the thing you have to define is how you do this flow between the two distributions. So there's many different choices. Um, the, the, the one by Lindman was to go from each uh, data point to normal zero one. So the conditional probability paths look like this. Um, and so right, each one is defined as a conditional uh, probability path that changes over time. So it's a Gaussian that varies over time. And what's nice about this is when you, uh, you have a closed form for the flow of Gaussians. Um, and so, but the, the trick is basically what choice you take. So if you do uh, just random uh, pairings, which is sort of the standard now, so this is, so there are three original papers for flow matching, I would say, uh, well, maybe more. Um, so three at the same time, at least, were, were Yaron uh, Lemins, um, one from Texas, so, uh, and, and one from Meta. So these sort of three papers had different uh, uh, ways of doing it. And, um, the 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 thing we've settled on is sort of probably this one is um, quite useful. Uh, it's sort of the simplest, uh, and uh, because you, well, it allows you to go from any distribution to any other, uh, and your your sort of uh, very simple objective. So uh, this one also works quite well. It's equivalent in many senses, uh, and maybe. Uh, uh, but okay, so the final one is optimal transport. So here you can see basically we select the the pairs of points based on an optimal transport matrix. Um, so why does this reduce variance? Um, 
it's because variance in the training objective happens anytime sort of two paths cross. So if you look at sort of a point in space and time, uh, you're looking here, basically what you're going to do is regress uh, uh, half the time, right? If you're, if you're on the, if you sample this from the green path and you would be going in this direction, if you sampled the red path, you would be going in that direction. Um, uh, and so, uh, sorry, uh, to the right or to the left. And so this means that, well, um, at this point, you're going to sort of have a stochastic regression that says go one way or the other. Uh, in contrast, in optimal transport, there are no paths across. And so the intuition is basically, if you can have fewer paths across, uh, conditional paths across, then your uh, variance in the training objective would be lower, in fact, right? So if you have a, if you have a perfect optimal transport map, then the variance will be zero because at every point in space and time, uh, you will have sort of one exact direction that is the correct, uh, correct way to go. Yeah. And the one, yeah, and then the, the examples that you show in the left and the middle, they are just the specific yeah. choices of this interpolation between the two distributions. You know, at exactly. And yeah. times, and you don't have to have like optimal properties like this optimal transport. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so you can sort of do these in multiple ways too, right? So let me uh, say so this was an OT one. So you can do OT between normal zero one and a, and a small Gaussian around your data point. Or if you think about uh, the standard diffusion ones, you can think about them in this framework too, right? So you can think about sort of the, the transformation of the Gaussian uh, about adding noise, right? To this, to this thing. Yeah. So variance exploding would just be like this and variance preserving. Well, you subtract the means you also get something like this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's just sort of a, it's thinking about the different choices of, of which way you want to go. And so, yeah, I think uh, this one's very nice, simple. So this one is like straight, uh, the velocity is constant. I I don't, uh, I think this is, um, yeah, I, I'm not sure why it seems to be that most people have settled on velocity is constant. Like, it seems like there should be better ones, but uh, I, as far as I'm aware, most people just use this. Uh, yeah, so. <laughs> um, Cool. Yeah, and actually, so one thing that's interesting, right, is that, um, yeah, so while the velocity is constant, oftentimes, at least in images, especially, you get a, a big benefit of adaptive step size solvers. So it seems like basically that uh, you need to pay attention a lot to the end in images. Uh, so you do a lot of steps near the end. And that means that, well, maybe a, a different schedule would be better that said, uh, you know, maybe slow down near the end. So I don't know, I think uh, that would be, that would be cool. But uh, who knows? Yeah. So I think it's still, we're still open about which, which ways to do this uh, process. Good. Cool. Um, okay. Yeah. So how do you implement this in practice? Okay. So very simple algorithm basically, right? So you sample uh, data points from both sides, uh, sample at random time. So figure out where here you are, um, sample the center of the Gaussian, we'll calculate it and then sample sort of a small uh, deviation away from that, uh, potentially none. So it seems to work in practice if you did none, but the math is nicer if you sample a little bit. So this sigma is often very small, uh, like 0 0.001 or something. Um, and then you, and then you uh, do the uh, the velocity, which is just x1 minus x0. And so this is your regression. And so this is the, the very simple algorithm and you can train large models like this. Uh, so yeah, this is very nice short gradient pass, right? Because you're just predicting directly something. Um, and as long as this uh, variance isn't too bad, then it works out well. So optimal transport, all you need to do. Uh, so um, there's sort of different things, right? So if you were to exact optimal transport, it would be very hard, right? Because you would need sort of full uh, optimal transport between your data distributions. And so the, if these are, for instance, continuous distributions like a Gaussian, uh, that's in fact, uh, we don't even really, uh, well, we don't have fast algorithms for sure. And there, there are ways, but it's very annoying, especially if it's large. So what we use is mini batch optimal transport um, and there are other ways too, but I think mini batch optimal transport is sort of uh, easy there's an easy knob to play with, which is the batch size um, that trades off sort of compute and uh, and reducing the variance. So um, we find sort of most times we use batches that are um, like between 32 and, and 256, basically. Uh, that seems to be enough, um, but it depends on sort of the, the relative size of your model and your, uh, and your compute time. So uh, if, you, if you're, for instance, like on CIFAR, I would say this is a, this is like a, a 1% or less overhead if you're using batch sizes, maybe 32 to 128. So uh, just because the model takes so much more time than the OT solve. Um, so we use exact optimal transport here. Uh, and in fact, you can do different ones if you, if you want. Um, cool, okay. Yeah, so uh, just getting back to it, right? Like why using optimal transport and flow matching? 
Well, you can see Sorry, sort of in the uh, past. Maybe yeah, one, please. <laughs> one question. Yes. Uh, so yeah. you mentioned just in the pseudo code. So you have these two mm -hmm. data points, like one from the data distribution, the other one from the base distribution. Yep. And then the optimal transport is giving you this pi, and pi is, uh, what is it exactly? It's like a distribution over. Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Yeah. Um, yes. So, uh, so if if this is sort of exact OT, then basically it's it's a matching uh, between x one and x zero. So I think about it as uh, uh, well. So in in practice, this returns up basically a matrix that is uh, x x zero size uh, by x one size uh, uh, with zeros with lots of zeros and then one one per row and column. So basically, a permutation matrix uh, that says which x one matches up to which x zero. And so then you can extract oh, sort yeah. of the indices. Yeah. Yeah, I see. So yeah, so x1 and x0 are just patches and then you just do like a, a match uh, between them. So that you exactly. probably minimize, yeah, minimize a cost function from the matching. Yep. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so in images we do Euclidean cost, although which cost you should use if it's more complicated than that is uh, unclear. Uh, yeah, so. and then you just do this linear interpolation between the, the match pairs. Uh, exactly, yep. Yeah, so exactly the same, same thing with the matched, uh, yeah, match points. Um, great. Yeah, so uh, why why use this, right? So faster training by reduced variance, faster inference by straighter path. So this is just an example in 2D, right? If you use random paths between these two distributions, uh, you get very wonky paths. But if you uh, if you do sort of the the, the mini batch apple and transport, then you get pretty straight paths. Um, and so, yeah, this is sort of, uh, well, okay, this is from a different presentation, but yeah, depending on if you care about the paths, you may want this too. Uh, so, yeah, um, cool. Okay, so great. Uh, yeah, so on images, this helps a little bit. So especially, so number of function evaluations when you're doing few function evaluations, so less than 10, you can see a, a fairly large improvement using optimal transport over sort of independent matching. Um, and it also trains slightly faster, as you can see, uh, per training step, you get fast, uh, better FID. Um, cool. The function evaluations here are for generation or for training? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, yeah, this is for inference. So uh, this is using an adaptive step size solver, basically. Uh, okay. Actually, it well, be no. to, to solve the, the, the differential equation. Yes. Exactly. Yes. Uh, yeah. So, sorry, this is not adaptive. This looks like uh, uh, an Euler solver. Um, so, picking specific number of steps for the inference. Uh, so, yeah, demonstrating sort of this the second part that you get starter paths. Uh, and so, this is uh, with batch size I think 128. So, uh, that's clearly quite small. So, it's surprising that you see benefits even at this scale. I would say. Um, but yeah, I, I think. Um, Um, okay, let's see, do we have time? I think, okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, adding stochasticity back in. Um, okay, so one of the things we were interested in is, uh, right, doing optimal transport is nice, uh, but there are nice things about stochastic uh, dynamics. So in particular, <laughs> one of the things I didn't talk about is these flow matching algorithms. Uh, they're very fast, but they're sort of more sensitive in some ways. So using ODEs, uh, while in theory, you get sort of uh, the same distribution over time. One thing that happens is uh, if you sort of perturb, right? Like I haven't, uh, I haven't seen anything that quantifies this very well, but basically if you perturb your input too much, then you can get something crazy because, well, you can go to go into a space where you haven't seen any data, right? So uh, uh, there's sort of empty spaces uh, in your, in your sort of paths over time. And so if you hit one of these, well, your network has no idea what to do and may shoot you off somewhere crazy. Uh, in particular, uh, first like stochastic dynamics, basically when you add noise, you sort of cover the space more. Um, and so this allows you to uh, be slightly more robust. And I think uh, when you're adding sort of a score function, the conditional score is very easy to learn. And basically it says, uh, point me towards data points anywhere I am, right? So even if you end up very far away, it's sort of adding this function that says, well, uh, go towards your data. So there's a sort of reasons to want stochastic, even though it's a little bit slower, you can potentially get slightly better performance, um, uh, especially away from your uh, you know, training data and stuff like this. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, uh, how do we, how do we sort of, so basically, uh, there's a, right. Using an equivalence, we can say there's, a, there's a matching between, uh, um, uh, 
deterministic and stochastic dynamics, but uh, what we would like to do is start with any uh, any distribution. So this is also called bridge matching uh, or Schrodinger bridge matching, uh, and there's sort of different ways to to do this. I'm going to talk about one that's based on sort of mini match up transport, uh, but there's there's interesting uh, many other ways to do this too. So uh, yeah, so if right, so you have your SDE, um, but the probability flow ODE allows this transformation, and so what you can do is uh, do sort of a flow matching loss, but also a score matching loss. Um, and so similarly, you can do a conditional flow matching loss and a conditional score matching loss. And so that allows you to say, uh, define any stochastic path between sort of your endpoints um, and, and learn sort of the stochastic dynamics between the two. So uh, instead of having a deterministic one, you can, you can do sort of stochastic dynamics uh, almost for free, right? So this is just adding another uh, loss and another sort of head to your network. Uh, which is kind of interesting. And then you can trade off uh, later what you would like to do. Um, so yeah, just sort of uh, that, that's, that's, that's the nice part. So uh, just the picture, right? So optimal transport is sort of these straight and narrow paths. Schrodinger bridges are uh, sort of, it smooths it out, right? So you sort of do uh, entropy. Uh, so yeah, this relates to entropy regulation transport basically. Yeah. So Schrodinger bridges, is solving this problem. So you're looking for sort of a, a, a process that maps from one distribution to another, um, but this minimizes the KL divergence with some reference process. And so uh, as this reference process goes to sort of uh, a Dirac process, then you recover an optimal transport as you get more and more noise and you get more and more entropy uh, and you get sort of a, a, a uniform mapping between the two so, uh, distributions. And so this basically controls uh, how much noise is in your uh, dynamics. And so it's uh, defined as sort of the most likely stochastic process under observations. And uh, the other characterization is, is also a mixture of Brownian bridges. So in particular, this is interesting, right? So the Schrodinger bridge is sort of a, a mixture using the uh, entropic optimal transport between your data points uh, and Brownian bridges uh, between them. So you can think about it as sort of doing instead of optimal transport exactly, uh, entropic optimal transport, which will sort of give you a, right, a batch by batch matrix, but not just zeros and ones, so not a permutation, but sort of a close to permutation, uh, depending on the depending on the regulation. And so that, uh, that is sort of interpolating between well random things uh, and uh, and and uh, optimal transport. So this sort of allows you to cover more space um, and do stochastic dynamics. Um, and and so I'm just going to briefly talk about what we found in general. Yeah. So the 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 sort of optimal transport is sort of the fastest way, right? So if you want to do really fast inference, I think basically the best steps are to do some sort of optimal transport. And then uh, if you want to do even better, but with uh, with slightly less quality, I would say do something like a rectified flow. So this I didn't talk about, but uh, oftentimes what people do is, is try to uh, learn one flow and then sort of sample data points uh, from both sides and then learn another model that does even fewer steps. So uh, this also works. That's sort of the, the best way to get a very fast model that throws your distributions. Um, one uh, question uh, about this. And if you uh, want stochastic dynamics, yeah, please. Sorry, just mm -hmm. one question. So you have these uh, V theta and S theta. Uh, I understand that yep. they are sharing the parameters, these two, I mean, mm -hmm. these are different networks or is the same network with just some different yep. representation or? Uh, yeah, yeah. so you can do either, right? I think uh, for images, we share most of the trunk because, well, it's, uh, it's more efficient, uh, but uh, in practice, uh, yeah, so I think it's sort of, if you, uh, basically, if you only care about going one direction, uh, so only care about generation, uh, then actually, if you're doing mini batch optimal transport, you can do uh, one network that's sort of uh, S theta plus B theta, if that makes sense. So uh, what what we need to do stochastic dynamics is to be able to calculate uh, this, this UT from, so what we learned, right, is this UT hat and the uh, gradient log PT uh, in, that, in that equation, right? Uh, but it turns out you can reformulate it. If you only want UT, uh, then you can just do sort of the correct addition and, and learn one network if you only want to go forward, right? So, but if you want to go backward, then you need uh, to learn both networks and be able to subtract the head or add the head. So um, 
the intuition is basically in forward dynamics, uh, you want to go, uh, this is a sort of a minus, and if it's backwards, then it's a plus. So uh, if you want to be able to go both directions, then you need to learn two networks. If you only need to go one direction, uh, then you actually only need to warn learn one network, which is sort of uh, using this math and, and you can um, mm -hmm. well, calculate UT. So yeah, I, I think uh, in practice for generation of stochastic dynamics now, we basically learn one network uh, that, that uh, and, and do one loss instead. Um, uh, but if you want to go both directions, then yeah. So uh, both directions is nice because what I didn't talk about is uh, our, uh, if you use mini batch optimal transport, you only need to go one direction. But if you do, if you learn sort of both directions then you can, uh, do this, these bridge packaging techniques, which is sort of outer loop, um, um, of, uh, yeah, uh, uh, outer loop, uh, of sort of, uh, these, these synchron iterations. And so this allows you to get sort of better synchron performance in theory. So this mini batch is biased, right? Uh, you, you, if it only, it only works if your batch size is infinity, uh, but you can sort of do this back and forth thing, um, to get slightly better performance sometimes. So, yeah, if that mm -hmm. makes any sense. <laughs> yeah, uh, cool. So, yeah, I think, uh, so yeah, so in the protein models, for instance, we only care about generation. And so we actually learn one network that's sort of uh, learning the, the the UT directly here. Um, and so just, you know, moving these uh, things around and, and doing one regression. Yeah. Um, cool. Okay, yeah, so yeah, we're doing, um, yeah, so so I guess stochastic for us is slightly more robust in the high dimension. So uh, because of this sort of conditional score, which is point towards your data points at all places, that sort of allows you to, uh, well, get back to somewhere good, basically, um, if you if you somehow stray away in your in your inference trajectories. So uh, that's what we think is happening. I don't know exactly what's happening, but uh, we find slightly better performance basically out of distribution when you when you add some sort of noise. Um, yeah. Uh, okay, cool. Yeah, and so, yeah, uh, we we we've also applied this to sort of uh, cell trajectories. Uh, that's sort of one of my other main things with the with the Helmholtz is very interesting. It's trying to figure out how cells change over time. Uh, I'll talk about sort of the molecule, uh, well, actually the protein design stuff uh, today, and uh, we have a new one on patient trajectories, which is kind of interesting. Uh, it's not quite out yet, but coming soon. So, um, yeah. Um, cool. So yeah, now getting to to protein stuff. Uh, okay, so I'm going to talk about what proteins are from well my uh, my limited computer science understanding, um, and then how how these uh, how sort of Foley models have used these to go from sequence to structure, um, and then going from folding models to flow matching models, uh, and uh, or motivating sort of flow matching uh, generation with the Foley models, and then finally sort of uh, what we think are still the, the big problems. Uh, Cool. So, okay. So proteins, what are proteins, right? Uh, proteins are a type of molecule in your body. Um, they're made up of a lot of uh, uh, sort of a sequence of amino acids. And so uh, you can express the sequence in terms of letters, well, because there's only 20 of them, uh, a subset of their nice alphabets. Um, and then, uh, but they actually exist in nature as sort of a three, uh, as a molecule, right? So as a, as a, as a bunch of coordinates. Um, and so what makes each amino acid different is sort of uh, which atom types they have. Uh, and so what you're trying to do is basically go, uh, trying to, trying to see what the protein looks like from a, uh, so the structure is useful for understanding, well, uh, what does it look like and maybe sort of how it functions, although that's less clear. Uh, so sort of what people thought, right. was the, the hard part was going from a sequence to sort of what it looks like in 3d. Um, so once you, uh, look, figure out what it looks like in 3d, then hopefully it's easy to figure out what it does. Uh, although not always true. Um, and so one thing is right. There's a sequence, but there can be sort of a a, a, confirma a bunch of confirmations of the structure. So these things exist in real life, and they can be quite flexible. Um, and so yeah. So uh, well, what do we have for data? Right. So we have lots of known protein sequences. This is very easy to sequence things, uh, but it's much 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 harder to uh, find a structure for things. So uh, in practice, we have many many fewer structures, and so. Uh, it would be nice to say be able to use all the sequences to go to structure, and this is sort of the problem solved by AlphaFold two, or at least attempted to be solved. <laughs> uh, to try and find well, what are the structures for any in sequence. Um, cool. Um, so yeah, there's sort of different reputations for these things. Uh, we're trying to 
uh, uh, so you can, uh, and in practice, we use many different ones. So you sort of look at the sequence, you can look at how the pairwise distances uh, are, you can look at the 3D coordinates, and then I'll finally talk about frames. So um, one of the nice things about molecules, right, is that we often have sort of these coordinate systems. Uh, well, we know specifically a lot of the bond length. So we, uh, so th that's very helpful. Uh, so we don't want, our, our, we can use this information for our models to make them slightly, uh, well, easier to learn. Um, Okay, so yeah, there's there's sort of right sequence and stru uh, structure that I'm mostly going to be focused on, um, and there's different ways to go from each to each other. So taking the sequence, uh, going to the structure, right? So this is often uh, in terms of alpha fold. So this is the the folding models, um, and although they can go to sort of confirmation, different confirmations, uh, that's another task uh, with a slightly different con uh, set of models. Um, if you're going from structure to sequence, and this problem is called inverse folding. So instead of folding, where you're trying to go from sequence to structure, you're going from structure to sequence. Uh, uh, recently, there's been a, a sort of lots of things that are trying to do structure to structure. So uh, the reason that you might want to do this is say you have partial structure uh, and you want to generate the rest. So in particular, this is interesting for scaffolding or other problems where you want to generate new proteins that do different things. Uh, and so this is often like a uh, partial structure or no structure. So unconditional generation to just generate new proteins or uh, conditional to get uh, pro proteins that might uh, bind with something or do something. Uh, so this, these type of models, uh, really the, the large, the, the first one that really uh, is the, um, sort of, yeah, the most popular and, and, and very, very good is art fusion. Uh, and then there's sort of other works that are building off of this and other uh, uh, to try and get well, different properties. So. Yeah, this is, um, that's the sort of structure to structure space. Uh, and then, yeah, sequence to sequence is also very interesting. So these are more language model uh, designs. And then uh, we're also interested in sort of structure and sequence to structure now. So um, there's sort of different different ways of formulating the problem, uh, but trying to figure out, well, uh, what can we do with sort of different inputs and outputs here? Um, okay, so I'll talk a little bit about the, the folding models. So I think, uh, one thing that's interesting about our diffusion is it's built directly from a folding model. So um, you take sort of the same weights of a folding model and then turn it into sort of a, a generation uh, model. Um, and so doing similar things, although from a slightly different perspective. So, um, so okay, so folding models, um, what you're trying to do is go from sequence to structure. And so uh, there's many different ways to get information, uh, but one of the big ones is sort of doing a multiple sequence alignment search. So looking for similar uh, similar sequences that gives you an idea about the evolutionary structure of the protein. And that sort of also gives you information about what may be close to what, because the idea is that things that are close should co-evolve. Um, and then you can also look for sort of similar structures that may be more information. But uh, so what I'm interested about is sort of the, the model architecture here. Um, so you take sort of uh, single representations and pairs, what it's called, and uh, do, uh, well, lots of blocks of this uh, sort of sub, uh, sub network even former that operates on both uh, and then do a fewer blocks that operates also on 3D structure. And so this, this is the basic structure here and then you do it three times. And so uh, one thing that's interesting, right, is you get multiple organizations, you get uh, sort of the very deep transformer. Um, so nice, so in particular, right, like relative to language models is very deep and very narrow. Um, and so depth 168 sort of comes from recycling three times. Um, <clears throat> and then, but what's interesting, right, is that recycling, right, of course, is equivalent to sort of doing a time independent ODE, right? So you're sort of updating uh, your initial representation based on your output and doing it again. <clears throat> um, but this, this is interesting because it relates to sort of flows. Um, so, yeah. Um, okay, so ESM fold is also uh, one of the big uh, models is the idea is to replace the sort of very annoying search of MSAs um, and, and, and templates with a sort of call to a language model. So ESM2 is a language model that takes in your sequence, uh, outputs a representation, and then do sort of the same, same model, so the same folding blocks and structure uh, to do a very similar architecture. So just replacing sort of the input with a language model. Uh, so still very deep, uh, very narrow, and changes the MSA to an LLM. Um, okay, so cool. Why is this interesting? Well, uh, so how do we how do we sort of do flow models? So okay, so yeah, um, 
So what we're interested in sort of is in these models that go from uh, first from structure to structure. Uh, and so a very noisy structure to clean structure. Um, and we're trying to do sort of different flows between them. So what's interesting, right, is that we uh, right, I sort of talked about different uh, ways of matching proteins, uh, well, sorry, matching uh, targets uh, and sources. And so right, this is sort of randomly. Uh, we can also do optimal transport matching, and we can also do this sort of uh, stochastic matching. Um, cool. Okay, so yeah, how do, how do these work in practice? So, okay, so we're building a flow over this manifold. Um, so how do you represent a protein with uh, with these frames? So each frame uh, represents a residue. You look at uh, it's sort of like the coordinates of its C alpha, so where it exists, uh, where this thing exists in space, uh, translation. And then how the side chain is rotated about it. So uh, basically, uh, how how these other atoms are oriented around it, and why is that useful? Is because sort of you have fixed notions of uh, where these should be in the frame relative to C alpha. So this allows you to sort of use the information of uh, of the sort of prior knowledge about what the the structure of each residue looks like, uh, instead of having to sort of learn that with the model. So you could do it in directly in three D coordinates, right, over all atoms, um, or you could. Uh, do this sort of coarse grain representation, which is uh, sort of some uh, uh, provides good prior information and is sort of easier to learn. So yeah, it was uh, the same idea in a full two structure module. Um, and yeah, so the, this sort of first one leverages the in, this, this sort of engineering work uh, and and uh, by a lot of people right uh, for a full two, but then open fold uh, is the code that we actually use um, for the flow model um, and also based on sort of uh, previous diffusion models. Um, okay, so why is a flow interesting here, right? So, okay, so um, uh, you can do diffusion over uh, rotation space. Um, and what you do is, uh, so what previous models did like arc fusion and frame diff is essentially do the score of an isotropic Gaussian. And so um, an isotropic Gaussian is, a, is the sort of uh, equivalent of heat diffusion uh, in rotation space. Uh, uh, this is, uh, well, somewhat annoying because you have to use the spherical harmonics, uh, and you uh, and so that's that's not super easy to calculate. And so, uh, in practice, you catch sort of uh, different uh, discrete representations of this, uh, and then uh, and then use those, yeah, over and over. Um, so, uh, instead, for flows, you don't need to do this, right? So, instead of having to calculate the score of an isotropic Gaussian, uh, <clears throat> you can do the interpolation between two points, and so. That's very nice uh, because, well, we do, uh, yeah, so the, the interpolation is much easier to do basically uh, because you don't need uh, to calculate this sort of uh, this power series. Uh, and you also uh, only only sort of need, uh, yeah, there's no sort of logarithmic. So so this, this is expressed in sort of matrix logarithm, uh, but there's sort of uh, numerical tricks that you can get around this. And so it's just using algebraic operations. Um, so yeah, that's the, that's very nice about flow. So I think flows, since it allows you to do sort of pairs of points, you don't need to worry about heat diffusion. So uh, others have used this over more general manifolds um, where it's even harder to define what heat looks like. Um, so as long as you have a geodesic, then you can do a flow basically. Um, okay, so so what does training look like for these models? Um, yeah, so I guess the, the idea is that, well, I want to do, uh, I want, to use models that directly predict where I'm going to go. So uh, the model actually outputs sort of what the rotation and translation will look like at, at time zero. Uh, and then we use that to compute a flow. So um, yeah, that's that's how it works. So uh, just thinking about things on manifolds, right? Um, this is how I think about it is basically, uh, I'm, I'm a, uh, my current state is sort of a plane at a random place and I, my model predicts my destination and then I calculate sort of which direction I should go based on that. Um, but, you know, there's sort of many ways to think about this thing. That's my very, uh, uh, yeah, rudimentary uh, explanation. So, um, cool. Okay, so, you know, one of the things, um, let's see, so, yeah, I guess we're going to, um, yeah, so one of the interesting things we were looking at is uh, one of the things I found that was that helped a lot in practice. Um, and I discovered by accident by I was trying to actually do a different parameterization, but then realized there was a bug in my code that worked way too well um, was to uh, the, the sort of relative um, speed of these two things matters. So 
uh, in practice, what we do is actually multiply the rotation speed during inference by 10 times time. Uh, so that means very fast at the beginning and very slow at the end. Um, and this helps a lot. So uh, we know that it improves sort of all the, the models that we've uh, looked at in terms of designability. So this metric I'll talk a little about uh, later, but uh, it's very interesting that this sort of trick uh, uh, the relative speed of things uh, matters a lot. And so this only works during inference. If you try and also do a training, it doesn't work so well. So um, yeah, would love to know why, I guess. Uh, yeah, so uh, many different explanations for why this is, but uh, I think the general idea is that once you have the, the rotations, then you can understand uh, the general structure of the protein, and then it's easy to figure out where each amino acid goes. Um, but I don't really understand yeah, why this this happens and when you can apply this more generally. So, um, yeah. okay, sorry, can you clarify a yeah. bit more what is this thing? So you say you multiply the rotation yeah. speed during inference. Uh, what does that mean exactly? The way I understand this is that maybe correct me if I am wrong. You work with this uh, amino acid, and what you work is with the location and the orientation of this. Is that yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. And uh, what does it mean like the rotation speed is increased? Or... Yes, so so in theory, this is the correct speed, right, of everything. So this is the flow that you should use given a predicted R0 and your current RT and XT. Uh, this is in theory correct. Um, in practice, what we do is uh, like take this equation and instead, uh, why is it? Oh, because I zoom all this. Uh, it's because uh, in practice we do this, except we multiply this by 10 times time. So we do 10 log RT of R0. Um, and so basically it's just faster, right? So this this means that at each step we do more uh, rotation than you should be at the beginning and less at the end. Yeah, so let me see if I understand it. So this, yeah, this, this function U is giving you the way the um representation of the data is updated as a function of time yes you know? exactly you are just basically multiplying by 10 the update that you would be doing at each infinitesimal step yeah you know? 10 uh, times time so here yeah. time goes from one to zero so more yeah. at the beginning and less at the end. so yeah. wh why exactly. why is this really helping why why, <laughs> why yes. is this thing making a difference or so i mean you wouldn't expect <laughs> it to, to work no because I mean, yeah, you, you this is very that, surprising yeah, to me that, from mathematics perspective, it's very wrong, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so I think this is probably going to be present in more and more models as we do like multi, um, right, multi-modal things. Uh, and I think it's basically because the models like to pay attention to one modality versus another, right? So it's sort of like, well, you're feeding in both, you're noising both, but uh, what does the model actually learn, right? Like, what does it actually pay attention to? In this case, I think it pays attention to the rotations a lot more than it does the translations. Uh, and why is that the case? You know, I think it's an inherent bias of how we structure these things. And maybe it's about the data too, right? So um, not really sure, right? Like, uh, but basically this sort of means that you're, it's almost like you decide your rotations first and then your translations, right? So it's sort of like a conditional generation thing. So, uh, you know, another way to do this, right, would be to generate all of your rotations just immediately first and then, you know, do the translations based on this, right? So uh, I think it's sort of like a, maybe the conditional structure of the space uh, is sort of what you're, what you're determining by, by doing this thing. So, uh, yeah. So just to understand the method, uh, this is basically similar to the methods you have discussed before. The main difference <clears> is that you operate in this space of uh, rotations exactly. and translations, and uh, that you this uh, uh, inference trick that improves the exactly. sample process. No? And yeah, okay. Yep. 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 Yeah. So yeah, everything's the same except well now we do it on manifolds, and all you need to do, you know is basically these changes. Um, so, yeah. Um, cool, okay. Let's see, what else uh, do we have time for? Okay, so yeah, I guess the, um, the thing that I want to say is, okay, so our first model is based on uh, structure to structure. So in particular on frame diff, so it's basically frame diff with low matching instead. Um, our, our sort of 
newer model is is interesting because well it takes in uh, also sequence uh, which we found helps a lot um, and uh, uses ESM2 so a pre-trained uh, language model as sort of uh, representations and then uh, does a very similar thing so these blocks are very similar just in different combination uh, and so what's interesting right is that this is very similar to what a folding model does right so you are sort of uh, you're taking sequence uh, and you're doing sort of uh, this this thing over and over again, although it's time dependent, right? So it's sort of like a time dependent of the folding models. Uh, so, and, and also much smaller. So what I would like to figure out is whether there's a way to do sort of folding uh, flows, sort of folding with flows, right? So AlphaFold uh, 3 sort of does a, a diffusion component, right? Um, but is there is there sort of a way to get uh, smaller models or more efficient models to train uh, using these flow matching things. So uh, this is sort of uh, fold flow two is sort of mixing the, the folding training uh, with uh, with generation training uh, and the model is getting sort of more similar to the, the folding model. So I think uh, these sort of things are going to converge very soon and, and we'll have sort of, um, yeah, convergence from both sides, right? So the folding models are sort of uh, becoming more like diffusion things and the, the diffusion models and flow models are becoming more like the folding models. So. Uh, it's, I think, a, an interesting idea to sort of make these models that are combining everything uh, and time dependent uh, and, and able to learn sort of one step at a time. So, um, but it's unclear, right, when you can do one step at a time or you just need a deeper model. So, um, yeah, I think this is sort of one of the things I'm very interested in exploring. So, yeah, that's what we've been working on. Um, cool. Um, yeah, so I guess to. Um, Let's see, to sort of wrap up, right? So what we observe in practice for flow matching for proteins is you sort of get faster training. And so with comparing directly sort of a, a diffusion model training and, and a flow matching training uh, for the same model and the same data, you get uh, sort of fewer training steps um, uh, for equivalent performance and then more efficient inference. You need fewer steps uh, to get equivalent performance for, for inference. Um, yeah, so... Uh, I guess, yeah, so where are things interesting and going? I think I'm very interested in sort of uh, the, okay, so yeah, so AlphaFold 3, right, came out uh, in May. Um, so it's very similar to AlphaFold 2 in many ways, right? It uses a thing with 48 blocks. Uh, it replaces the, the structure module, which was eight blocks before with a diffusion module. So uh, this is sort of interesting and also removes some sorts of invariance. And so uh, I'm very curious about when this invariance applies. Uh, and um, and then yeah, mixing sort of these continuous and discrete flows. I think uh, a lot of people are interested in this sort of yeah, trying to do flows on the discrete sequence space too. So yeah, um, cool. Uh, yeah. So thanks so much. Yeah, I'll I'll, I'll take some questions now. Um, um, yeah. Yeah. If anyone wants to ask any question, please unmute yourself uh, and feel free to ask. Uh... Hey. Uh, in the context of AlphaVault 3, you mentioned they yeah. removed uh, SC3 equivariant processing with diffusion model. Do you have yeah. any ideas or intuition why that would be um, applicable in that case, why you'd be able to use diffusion model there? And yeah. Yeah, so I suspect, right, the, the equivariance gives you, uh, is easier to learn, but of course, if you have enough power, then you really don't need it, right? So uh uh, there's two reasons that you can, you should remove it, right? Is if not everything follows that structure. So if you're doing other types of molecules, which they are, right? So small molecules and RNA uh, and DNA, it's not clear that they all have the same equivariance. So they don't have the same amino acids. So uh, removing it allows you to process every type of molecule at once. Uh, so that's a good motivation. And the second thing is basically, yeah, more power gives you the ability to, well, not, not need this sort of bias. So and get some of the performance. So I think, you know, more training and more flexibility are sort of the, the reasons. But, you know, if you don't need that, right, is it, it's probably still good uh, to to have equivariance of some sort. So, yeah. It's more like a data, data efficiency thing. Exactly, yeah. Okay, thanks. Any other question? Maybe just for clarity, uh, I mean, you didn't mention, but I assume most of this work is also done in collaboration with uh, this startup that, that you co-founded, uh, Dreamfold. Yes, startup. yes, yes, exactly. Yep. So, yep, working on this and yes. Cool. Um, 
Good. Uh, I know if anyone wants to ask anything. If not, we are almost uh, close to the time, and we could just uh, finish the seminar uh, now. Um, no last questions? No? Good. Cool. So yeah, Alex, uh, thanks a lot for the super interesting seminar. It's been great to have you here and uh, yeah. hope, to, hope to see you soon in the future. Thanks. You All too. the best in your uh, new faculty job at Duke. <laughs> thanks. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.